Today's uh, speaker, Stefan Kispu, uh, has stories, poems, and essays have appeared in numerous magazines and anthologies. His first book, Next Door Lived a Girl, won the Low Fidelity Press Novella Award. Novella Award. It's been translated into Dutch, Spanish, and Japanese, and South Road Press is bringing out a new edition. Uh, well, it, it must have done that uh, hopefully in August uh, this year, 2015. Uh, his second novel, Your House is on Fire, Your Children All Gone, was published by Penguin in uh, 2012. It was a top pick of Oprah Magazine, made Entertainment Weekly's must list, and Slate editor Dan Coyce named it one of the best books of the year. It was translated into German and Spanish and is forthcoming from East Press, Japan. In the spring of 2014, the literary thriller Messer, Gobble, Cher, Leek uh, from uh, Knife, Knife Fork, Scissors, uh, Flames uh, is uh, the English title. Uh, it was published by Tropen Berlag Kletkota, Germany. Uh, developed wrote that uh, Stefan Kitzbu is the inventor of the German Gothic novel. And his L.A. noir uh, flukpunk Los Angeles, Vanishing Point, was released by Ars Vivendi Verlag in January of this year. His new book, The Staked Plains, is forthcoming next month in November of 2015. And again, he teaches creative writing at Sonoma State University. Uh, so please uh, help me to welcome Stefan Kisbo. to how we do that and how we always fail to imagine anything really. Mm. But before we come to that, I want to take a little bit of a detour because right now what we're experiencing in publishing, in reading experience, and I'm not crushed something, is a little bit of a war between so-called genre fiction and literary fiction, proper literature. Um, and this little, little cartoon illustrates really well how we often think, how we often pigeonhole literary fiction and genre fiction. Genre fiction being interesting. We have romance, we have detectives, we have noirs, we have robots, monsters, all the same. Uh, everything that you can imagine, we can conjure up. It's fun to read. Um, whereas literary fiction often gets sort of pushed into this tiny little pigeonhole of divorcees, a child has died, uh, they have often very bad cases of heartburn, they have pacemakers, they really don't enjoy life very much, they sit in this vast desert of nothingness that is the years between 30 and death, when you live in cubicles and have dead end jobs, and there's no fun to be had because really after college you die. In American culture, we die after college. If you scour the pages of literary fiction that are set after college, it's all dreariness, horrible responsibilities. Because that hello up there. Um, and it's really not worth living. There's nothing um, about adulthood that's really cool, engaging. And so literary fiction often gets this, oh, it's sour, it's boring, people don't really do anything. Because often literary fiction also, of course, is made of the fabric of the everyday. Whereas in genre fiction, we can escape to whichever world we want to. We have everything open. 
Um, but also, sort of in the last maybe 10 years, uh, people have noticed that people don't go to genre fiction to enjoy great prose. In fact, great prose is often a detriment to the enjoyment of genre fiction. If we read a detective novel, we don't want super nicely crafted, really fresh imagery. We want the one-line zingers, we want the hard-boiled detective, we want the damsel in distress. All our perceived notions of what we want in real life are suspended and we just want to dive into this very often kitschy world, seedy worlds, or worlds just beyond. Um, so publishers have taken notice and um, yeah, um, that genre fiction is often considered fun and proper literature not. And so you have a new crop of authors, and I only have three examples here. Um, Colson Whitehead, Ben Percy, and Kazuo Ishiguro, who are considered or started out as literary writers. Um, they all had books published, very highbrow literature, and then were asked often by publishers, come on, you can do genre. Let's do it together. You know, you bring the language facility, you bring the excitement of a really well-written novel to zombies, to werewolves, to vampires, to all that. Let's mix it together and bring something that can be reviewed in the pages of the New York Times as well as sell gazillions. And so what these people have come up with is a zombie novel, a werewolf novel, and a fantasy alternate history novel, uh, The Buried Giant. All of these are doing well. If you check Amazon uh, rankings, uh, they're selling. They're doing really well. Um, and I think what we're experiencing right now is the renaissance of genre fiction, the re-evaluation of genre fiction, that it's no longer smelly and stinky to read genre fiction, but that you can actually sit in a literary seminar anywhere where you want and talk learnably about genre fiction and what you like about it. That genre fiction no longer takes a backseat to literature, but is in fact literature. And personally, I would argue that literary fiction, which I really like, um, I'm, I'm not bashing literary fiction. Literary fiction um, is also a genre, a kind of genre. And, and I think everybody realizes right now that instead of talking about this is this and this is that, and making up little, little terms for that, we're talking about literature. The things that are exciting about certain terms of literature and, and not. And what works in one might not work in the other. And we can look at them as well as equals. Um, OK. Um, that I wanted to set up because, because really, um, Traditionally, science fiction has gone where nobody else has ever gone before, um, has tried to do something, has been partaken in a, in a project that literary fiction also does, just very differently. Um, instead of talking about us, the way we live, the kind of breakfast you had this morning, uh, whether it was Wheaties, or a bagel with locks. Um, science fiction has always gone outside to really try to get a very peculiar view. And that's, and that's a view that I think everybody really wants to get at least once in their lives. And that's to step outside ourselves, which is really the holy grail of being human. I have three large dogs, and I don't think 
even though I don't think we have really tapped into potentials of animals. Um, I don't think they ever have this feeling of, gee, I really wonder what's kind of above me, or if I could look from the outside at me, what would I actually see? What would I notice? But science fiction writers have always been fascinated with going outside of our planet, our galaxy, our civilization, and looking at what's possible, what's there. But mostly also, who are we actually in the process? So usually in our daily lives, and this is taken, this is a really bad graphic. Uh, this is from, taken from the video game. This is what our everyday looks like. We're walking along, we're looking at walls, we're following a certain path. We often don't know where the path leads, where we are in relation to something else, but we know we have to go. Why we have to go, we're not so exactly sure, but progress has to be made, so we'll just walk and, and, and see where it is. Um, at some point in our lives, we're starting to think, all right, where's all this going? Uh, what am I actually doing here? Where, where is here? And that starts at any given time. It might start when you're three and you're sitting in your parents' garden and you look at the sun and it's really blindingly hot. Um, it might come the first time when you're 10 and you notice that what your parents have been telling you for 10 years is not true. Um, but at some point you notice that there is you and there's the world around and we're, slight, we're starting to lift up and trying to find where exactly we are. This would be, of course, ideal if somebody gave us, this is your life map, here you go, now follow the rules, but usually we don't have that. And this is science fiction's holy grail. We lift up and we can finally see from above what maze we are actually caught in. We're always caught in a maze. We're never out in the open. We're always in a maze. We will always be in a maze. But this is kind of what science fiction really tries to achieve. And it goes there directly. It doesn't take the divorcee whose child has died and who lives in a soggy apartment in downtown New York, downtown Manhattan. Um, we go out. We try to get that glimpse directly by actually leaving our orbit. And if we are lucky, then we get this. We can even get the place, our little maze here, and where that's situated. Gradually, we're getting a clearer view of what we're actually really talking about. And if we are really super lucky, we get something like this. Um, but there's a problem with that. Whenever we try to step outside ourselves, we face a void because outside ourselves is a little bit like having no hands, having no eyes, having no ears, and being something that we can't even fully comprehend. Um, I'll tell you a little anecdote. Um, when I was about 18, I lived in the vast nether regions of Lower Saxony and um, I hitchhiked to Berlin very often. I had friends there, I stayed with them. And in about three years, I hitchhiked once around the planet just by going from approximately Hamburg to Berlin, back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. Hitchhiking now, whenever I tell my students that, they look at me like I'm kind of the Antichrist or Hitcher, the highway killer, or how many people have been killed in your youth. But in 80s Germany, that was no big deal, especially when you went to Berlin, because as you will recall, there was still a wall, there was still the transit highway. So once you got on the transit highway through eastern Germany, um, you were good. You didn't have to get out again. You weren't even allowed to, to switch cars or whatever. 
And so um, it, was, it was actually a nice route to hitchhike. And one, one day, um, a businessman picked me up in his BMW. And it's not often that you get picked up in a BMW. So it's always a special treat. It was a big one, too. So I was like, oh, cool. And I jumped in the car. And he's a businessman on his way from Germany to Spain. He has a long, long drive ahead. And he wants to stop and have lunch. And I, of course, have no money because I'm still a high school student. So he says, oh, I'll invite you. So we stop at a restaurant. And when I come back from washing my hands, he has ordered frog legs for us. That was not something that was on the menu where I came from. Um, not at all. Also, I was really, at that point especially, very much against frog legs uh, and what was done to the frogs. And if you have ever seen Tony Unger's cartoons, you will never eat frog legs again. Anyway, there I was, stuck with this businessman who had ordered frog legs. And it would have been, of course, totally rude to say, well, wait a second, we can eat frog legs. So I ate them. Afterwards, people asked me, well, what did they taste like? And that's exactly our problem. That is the biggest problem we face. As human beings, we can't express a single new thing. We don't have the tools. It's not in our language. Because if we had a new word, we would use the new word, but we don't have that word yet. Just imagine, like, if you want to express, you meet someone. You meet someone and you fall in love. You meet someone and they mean the world to you. And you are by yourself for the first time. You're moving in closer and you want to say it for the first time, just how much you feel for that person. What do you say? I love you. When you call your mom, you say, love you, mom. When you call your dad, love you, dad. When you call your sister, love you, sister. We only have one stupid word for all this huge range of emotion that comes with loving someone and many people. We have only one word. And so, I've eaten frog legs, and people ask me, so, how were they? What did they taste like? And the only thing I have to say is, well, I'm sort of like chicken, but better. That's all I have. And it's really not very satisfying, uh, because it, of course, didn't taste like chicken. It tasted like frog legs. So I have actually two choices. I can't say, well, it tasted like frog legs. Or I can say, well, it tasted like chicken, but better. And both is really, really stupid and unsatisfying. Um, and that's what we're faced with. Whenever we actually do encounter something new, we're stopped. We can't say anything about it. We come back from our journey and say, well, that was pretty nice. Well, that was amazing. That was a life-changing event. But when we try to get to actually what was different, mm, stopped. And that's what um, filmmakers have always faced. And I want to take a little detour to F Star Wars. It's coming out December 18th. I'm really stoked about that. Um, I saw the original one when I was a little kid. And it was sort of one of these milestones. And it's hard to imagine that it was, but there it is. And Star Wars had, of course, the problem, well, how do you show the future? What is the future? How does the future look like? And what we get is not actually something advanced. What we get is a throwback. If you look at Harrison Ford, he's a cowboy. You know, he wears the vest. He has the six-shooter, although light stuff comes out. But he's a cowboy without the 10-gallon head. And if you look at the next picture, even more so. If he wore a cowboy hat and it was sort of lying there, he could be in any Western of that scene. So instead of going forward, what do frog legs taste like? We go backward and say, well, it's chicken, but kind of nicer. And that's what we have here. 
It's a cowboy, but the weapons are much cooler. And here's Chewbacca, of course. Um, we can also see that Boba Fett. When you really look at Boba Fett in his outfit, um, and you have watched Game of Thrones, you see the similarities. If you go and see the Sagrada Familia uh, by Antoni Gaudi in Barcelona, a huge cathedral, um, Art Deco Cathedral, it, this is it. This is a medieval knight spruced up to look new. For this guy, I'm really excited, Captain Phasma, also Game of Thrones Link, um, Brienne of Tark will play Captain Phasma. Um, it's a knight. It's really a knight with a gun. We're going back to something that we understand, but that's a long time over. And in, instead of inventing something that we can't really imagine what that would look like, we go back in time and give the viewer something that doesn't look familiar anymore. All right, then we have, of course, Kylo Ren, the new baggie, and, and you probably followed the huge debate about these two little extensions there of the lightsaber and why that makes sense or doesn't make sense at all and how ridiculous that is, and many people are really pissed off because of that sword. But if you look at the sword, the lightsaber was always a very medieval weapon. Yeah, it was light, but it could cut through things in awesome fashion. But it was always like a very weird weapon when they have all these really cool guns and, and ray guns and laser guns and whatever. Uh, the sword was always kind of weird. And now it's really going back to its origin. And no, it's a knight's sword, and they are the knights of Ren. And, and, and we're going back to a very, very medieval imagery in order to explain what the future looks like. All right, let's look a little bit at the cold earth of Anthem, because that's why we're here. Um, Gatham is really not that different from Earth, other than it's really, really cold. And we have the same mechanism that we find in Star Wars. Only here, Ursula K. Le Guin um, is, of course, not George Lucas. And her goal is not just to entertain with a wild story, with basically a Western story, but she uses it because she wants to talk about gender. She wants to talk about how a world without war could look like, how people who are 25 days neutral and then uh, suddenly spring into action either as a man or as a woman might change the social fabric that we find on a place. So it is kind of important that we find something that is relatively familiar <coughs> to us. And in what you find the foretellers, um, if you are schooled in Greek mythology or in any kind of mythology, you know where that comes from. It's, we understand it immediately. We don't have to uh, have an explanation for how foretelling works. We are all familiar with that. Even the machinery they use are archaic human machines. Um, I picked at some... Um, illustrations for the novel. And whenever we try here to imagine what Gethin might look like, we, we feel we, we end up with forms that we can already find. And here you find something almost between an igloo and the, the Red Square in Moscow um, architecture that, that seems strange and it's beautifully rendered but at the same time brings up very familiar forms. Here, um, this helmet I really like because it's so Art Deco. It goes back 100 years to show us what 2,000 years later might look like. Because we're not familiar with that anymore. We don't run around with jackets and suits and shoes that have that look. And so we can use it again. We use something old to get to something new. All right. All of this <clears throat> brings 
brings me to Solaris, the novel by Stanislav Lem, um, which takes on this question directly. How do we imagine new things? And if this all sounds really, really um, negative and doomy and gloomy, it's, it's not. It's, it's science fiction is a very, very heroic gesture. It's, it's, a, it's a gesture that is always doomed to fail, but nevertheless has to be done because you fail so beautifully and artfully. But it's, science fiction tries really to go where we can't know what we find in order to find ourselves. And that is Stanislav Lem's novel, um, Solaris, which presents us with a planet uh, with a red and a blue sun. And the planet is covered in what looks to be an ocean. And it's moving. And it is intelligent. But through many, many, many expeditions to Solaris, humankind in the novel has still not found out how the planet operates, how it thinks, what it really does, what's really in the ocean. And Len gives this um, history of explore, exploratory tours to Solaris to end up with the current spaceship hovering over the space station, over the planet, and things have turned ugly. Um, the scientists have tried to send more aggressive rays into the ocean um, to stimulate the ocean, to, to, to try to converse with this thing that they don't know what it even is or might be. Um, and what has happened as a result is that the worst nightmares of the astronauts on board the space stations come into their rooms. Whatever haunted you the most, the dead wife, the dead kid, somebody else, something that happened in your past, will appear. So the planet is, instead of the astronauts examining the planet, the planet is examining the astronauts. And here are some illustrations of how we can maybe imagine that. Um, ocean, at, ocean surface, it, it, it undulates. It's very slowly moving. Um, at first they think that that might be the brain of the planet. Later they surmise it might be, the ocean might be a giant muscle. But they can't figure it out. Um, and, and here, I found this, and it's kind of a, a ridiculous cartoon, but I liked it because if we imagine this kind of very badly put together spaceship, this is exactly what the, what the planet does. We think in it, and it throws back our own imagery at us to say, here, what does this mean to you? I saw in your brain that that's really haunting you. What does it mean? What do you make of that? Huh? <clears throat> Let me see. Let me get a look at you. What does it mean? And I think here is, is really the key to what science fiction does, and where it always fails, and beautifully so. Whenever we try to step out of ourselves, we don't know how to perceive that. Just imagine a being that is pure light. And it might not be even the light we can see, because what we can see is really very little. How would we interact with that? We can only interact with things that have hands, that we can touch, that we can smell, that we can see. And when you're getting older, you're losing all your faculties, too. You, know, you, don't, you, you notice that, that hearing and seeing uh, isn't really all that great, and it's, it's deserting you very quickly, and your world dims, and, and what else might be out there? 
But how do we, how do we interact with that? And so one of the astronauts who has just arrived at the station to clear up the mess that has happened there, uh, what he, oops, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, let's see. Um, he finds his dead wife. She killed herself, suicide, uh, he feels responsible for. And, and suddenly has to deal with, well, this is a replica, but it's also her. It's exactly like her, but it's also how I remember her. It's not her, but it's what's stored in my brain about her. So even that thing that he can touch, that he can put his hands on, that he can smell, is a figment of his imagination. It's of what he can perceive, what he is able to perceive. If he had sent his son into space, he would see a different kind of person. It would be a different woman. He sends her out into space, zooms her off, another one appears, a third one. He starts liking her, but the thing is like we get attached to it, but at the same time we don't understand what it is, who she is, how she came to know things, how she accesses her, his brain, none of that. So once we actually try to step outside ourselves, we find only us. And this is what one of the characters says in the novel. We have no need of other worlds, we need mirrors. We don't know what to do with other worlds. A single world, our own, suffices us. But we can't accept it for what it is. And so the whole project of science fiction is really to discover who in the world we really are. But instead of going to the divorcee with the bad child and heartburn and cubicle work, we drive out into the vastness of galaxies and future times in order to confront ourselves. What we're really looking for is not new worlds, but who we are, answers to what really bugs us in the here and now. And, and the problem there is always what we imagine is already us. Um, if, you, if you look back to the, just in your mind, to this blue maze and the mouse and the cheese, for the mouse, all she can think of is the maze. If she went out, she's like, oh, there are no blue walls. Where's the cheese? I can't smell the cheese anymore. What we always find is a blue maze and cheese. We are this mouse or the rat, and we always find blue walls, cheese. Because that's all we have. So we're stepping, or we're trying to step outside, but we can't, because there is nothing. Outside of ourselves, we can't think, because even the thought of getting outside ourselves comes from inside ourselves. There is no outside. Another example of how lonely we really are, and I know that sounds really to me, but it's not, it's, it's beautiful, you know, because we're, we're pushing against that, and we know we can't get out, but the push is worth the push. So, so just imagine a newlywed couple, um, husband and wife sitting at a beach in Hawaii, sunset, they're sitting there, so show like hands on their shoulders, you know, like arms around each other, and she goes, beautiful, and he goes, Beautiful. She is thinking about their suite that they're going to return to. And it's really nicely stacked, and there's a really cool bottle of really expensive vodka waiting. And she really can use a drink right now because she spent her whole day on the beach, and it's really sandy, and she feels burned. She's looking forward to put some lotion on her arms. And the guy is thinking, Ah, maybe I can sneak out and go to see that waitress downstairs in the bar. She was really so nice. My goodness. It's terribly stereotyping these two, but, but anyway, stay with me for a second there. We're looking at the same thing, 
the beautiful sunset. We say beautiful, but we can't know what anybody else is thinking because we can't get out of our head. So on that level, it doesn't work. And on the bigger level, it doesn't work either. So all we have is really, and I want to leave you with that, we are looking into mirrors. This is from Tarkovsky's movie of Solaris, uh, made in the 70s. And it's a beautiful image for me because these are really trying hard to understand why they are even there, how she can be there even though she's dead on Earth and now she's alive on Solaris, on the space station. But all they see are each other. All they see are themselves. That's all we really are left with. That's all we really have. And so science fiction is always doomed and it's beautiful. And if we don't do it, we get much, much poorer. We become very, very poor human beings because we don't even engage in that daring failure. But in the end, we only look into the mirror, and there we are, with our droopy skin, failing eyes, failing ears, and whatever else we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions uh, from the audience? Anyone uh, question they'd like to get an answer to? Well, thank you so much. To her. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. Oh, um, uh, the question is if um, movies like Star Trek were a minority report influence development, technological <coughs> development. Um, if we see something cool like this, the screen, touch screen, in the movie, and then somebody goes, oh, but maybe that, that is actually possible. And, and yes, I, I, I would think so. Um, I would think that just imagining cool things, like Jules Verne, the, the French author, uh, who imagined a helicopter when there were no helicopters, uh, who imagined a submarine when there were no submarines. Of course, um, fuel human engineering. Uh, usually the ideas are virulent at that time. Somebody comes up suddenly, I mean, we're, it's brewing and then somebody formulates it in, in its entirety. But, but if we speculate hard enough, uh, we will always come up with something new. And so, so real life always learns a lot from art, so yes, absolutely. Tell, teleporting back. <laughs> teleporting back. <laughs> yeah, 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 and uh, food powder, I like that too, you know, and it's, it's, it's all good, yeah, yeah, that, that'd be great, that'd be really great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Okay. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone, for, for coming.